everybody. So uh, today we are going to talk of um, the consequences of special relativity. I'm sure uh, this, this portion is not new to you, but um, uh, we'll we'll talk of um, uh, the uh, Doppler effect in light. The uh, the prerequisite for that is of course you know a bit of um, time dilation things that we have covered earlier. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Doppler effect in sound. Um, uh, let's see what it is there in light when we uh, talk of electromagnetic waves, example light, okay. And uh, after that, uh, we'll check or rather we'll, we'll see whether the uh, mass of a body actually, whether it varies with velocity. You may have heard of such things, but let's see where it comes from, okay. So, Let's first of all consider, uh, uh, you know, we consider a light source and then that's emitting photo, uh, emitting light of, of a certain frequency. Let's just, let's call that frequency nu zero, okay. And uh, you have an observer here, we, we, I show it by O here on uh, to, towards the right of your screen. Uh, I mentioned that uh, of uh, the Doppler effect in sound. I'm sure where uh, instead of this light source, you will be having someone, some source which is emitting, uh, which is emitting sound, okay, which is making some noise and then uh, emitting uh, certain frequencies. Um, and then it's all, it's all fine when they're at both of them, both the observer and the source is at rest to each other. But what happens if all of a sudden one of them starts moving, okay? So uh, let's say the, uh, the one of the source start moving and then uh, the observer starts moving. Well, if you have the observer starts moving towards these, uh, the source of the sound, don't you feel that, uh, you know, the uh, frequency of uh, the sound that you are hearing uh, has increased? It's more like uh, a car coming towards you, you know, and it blows, the car blows its horn. Then the more it comes towards you, you find the pitch of the uh, sound increasing. Well, so what is it with light? Do we observe certain the same things or is it a little bit different? Let's check that out. Of course, uh, need to mention the very beginning. So uh, for propagation of light here, you don't need a material medium because it can propagate through vacuum. But for sound, of course, you need a material medium, okay? So that's what we do. We consider a, a light source, which is emitting light of a certain frequency. That's nu zero and then we have an observer, okay? Now, what we can also do, you can also consider this uh, a light source, you know, as a clock that's ticking, like this tick, 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 and then at, at each tick, each each one of these ticks, okay, and uh, it's emitting a light wave, okay. So it's uh, so what you're considering, uh, you're considering a light source as a clock, uh, in a sense that is ticking uh, new zero times per second. And so on each tick, it's emitting uh, uh, a wave, okay? So it's, now why do we put all these clocks and things here? Then because if you put these clocks, you know, time dilation, you really, you can make the uh, correlation and then we can use the, uh, all the principles of relativity that you've learned earlier. And now let's see what happens if uh, you have the source here, you have the light source which is emitting a certain frequency and the observer starts moving. Now we, we can have three situations here. Either uh, the observer is moving transversely or perpendicular uh, to the direction of these light waves, or it's moving towards the light source, or it's moving away. So let's let's consider each of them one by one. Okay. Okay. So case number one. So in this, what we have is that the observer, that's uh, we denote by O here, and it's moving uh, uniformly with a certain velocity. V, okay, Transver transverse to the direction of the light waves, okay. Now, if you are, you know, in the frame of the light source itself where the things are at rest, okay, and uh, what's the, uh, uh, what's the proper time in the sense between the ticks, you know, you consider the light source to be a clock which is ticking and each of these ticks, it's emitting a, it's a, it's emitting a light wave. Okay, so what's the proper time here? Let's call it T0. Then how is it related with the frequency? Well, you know, you know, frequency is in hertz and time, it's in seconds, so it's one by nu zero, okay? So that's the uh, proper time interval between the ticks, 
uh, in the light source frame. Okay, now what about uh, how would the observer then find this time to be? Okay, now in the frame of the observer, uh, the time elapsed between two ticks would be t. Now t will not be same as t zero, which was the proper time. Remember, but t will be t zero divided by root over of one minus v square by c square. Okay, it's this very simple time dilation formula that we've used here. Okay. Now, uh, what would then be what would then be uh, the uh, frequency of um, the light as observed by the observer? Well, you take just the inverse of uh, the time here. Remember, this time is the one measured by the observer in his in, in his or her frame. Okay. So let's call this frequency as nu t. It's going to be one by t, and then you know what one by t is. You're going to you just uh, see in the, in, the, in the previous paragraph. So you'll see that it's root over of one minus v square by c square whole divided by t zero. Now t zero is also related with the uh, frequency at which the uh, light is being emitted. Okay, so you see that so nu t that's the uh, that's the uh, frequency as measured by the observer that will be nu 0 times root over of 1 minus v square by c square. Now since v is always less than c here, okay, it is going to be v t or the, uh, 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 since the velocity of the, uh, of the observer is always going to be less than the velocity of light. Okay. So uh, what you find as nu t that is the uh, frequency as measured by the observer will always be less than the proper frequency. Okay proper time interval and then you know the proper frequency if I can put it that way. So nu t here is less than nu 0. So that is the frequency that is that will be measured by an observer who is moving transversely to the uh, to the source of light. Okay. So that leaves us with two other cases. One in which the observer is moving towards the uh, towards the light source and in the other when the observer is moving away from the uh, light source. Okay, so let's consider the other one first, uh, the, namely the one in which the observer is moving away from the light source. Okay, so here too, uh, you know, what's the uh, proper time between ticks? If I, it's going to be one by well, it's t zero, which is like one by nu zero. That's when nu zero is the frequency at which the light is being emitted at the source. Okay. And remember here the observer is moving with a velocity v away from the light source. So in the frame of the observer, if t is the time that, uh, you know, small t is the time that the observer will measure between each of the ticks, so as to say, then for in, in time t, remember the observer is also moving with a certain uniform velocity v. So the observer has already traveled v t that is uh, that's the unit of distance here uh, away from the source between the ticks. Okay. So this implies uh, that the time interval between uh, two successive ticks as measured by the observer okay, will be what? Will be v t by how much will it increase? Will increase by v t by c where t is the time as measured by um, uh, you know, by the observer here, right? And uh, and v t by c and c is the velocity of light, and that has the same, um, you know, that so the value of c is going to be the same in in both frames. Okay, now what will be the total time between the arrival of successive waves or the successive light waves in the frame of the observer? It will be first uh, the time between two ticks as measured by uh, you know by the observer plus the amount of time you know the observer has moved away in a sense by, by which time the observer has already moved by a certain distance between these two ticks. Okay, so the time elapsed between the arrival of successive waves will be capital T which is small t plus v t by c. Okay. Now 
you, you simplify this as t plus and then you take a bracket of 1 plus v by c. Okay. Now, how is t related with the proper time, small t that is, small t is related with the proper time t0 by small t being equal to t0 by root over of 1 minus v square by c square and then you have the bracket 1 plus v by c. So, that simply simplifies to the 1 given at the bottom of your uh, screen that is t0 into root over of so 1 plus v by c divided by 1 minus v by c. Now, how would you find the you know the frequency here? It is that all you need to take is uh, the inverse of the time, time interval um, in this case. You see here I have put it as v mi uh, nu minus. So, that is 1 by capital T. Now, that you just you just invert uh, the expression that you see in the top of your screen and then you relate uh, T0 with the uh, frequency that is the uh, frequency with which uh, the light is being emitted by the light source and then you immediately find what is a nu minus okay and then you can relate nu minus to nu 0 and then you see that nu minus is actually less than nu 0 here okay so in every case you see that um, the change in frequency so far we, we have seen that it's depending on the velocity of the uh, observer okay the velocity with which the observer is moving away from the uh, the light source here. Okay, so what about the uh, last case? So in this case, uh, let's say the observer is moving towards the light source. Okay, so um, so by the same logic which we had applied earlier, the observer travels um, a distance uh, which is v times small t towards the light source between successive ticks here, successive ticks of the uh, imagine uh, of the clock uh, that we have considered here okay so the uh, total time interval between the arrival of successive uh, waves here of light waves here would be uh, uh, that's the capital t would be small t then remember it's minus vt by c okay why minus because the uh, observer is moving towards the it is moving towards the light source and then we have kept the uh, velocity of light is it's, it's the same in both frames. I mean whether you are in a moving frame, uniformly moving frame or in a rest frame. Okay? So, that is why it is the same C. So, um, it is uh, it's natural now. So, you do the simplification. You, uh, you know you convert the small t into t0, t0 being the proper time. Okay? And here what you will find is that uh, when you take the observed frequency, when you, uh, when you find the observed frequency, it is going to be, if I put v nu plus here, that is nu plus is 1 by capital T. And uh, we are going to see that nu plus here is more than nu 0. Okay? It is going to be more than the frequency of uh, uh, the, uh, the emitted light. Okay? So, we have studied uh, three cases in which the first case um, the observer was moving perpendicular to the light source, okay. then the one was moving away from the light source and then towards the light source. However, I should uh, also mention here that in all cases you have seen that in, of, in all these cases uh, the shift in uh, the frequency uh, as observed by or the, the by by the observer okay uh, depends on the velocity of the observer here okay so you do see it in all these um, uh, in all these formulae here another important point uh, that i should uh, mention here is that in each of the formulae that you have seen so far i have always considered to light source to be at rest why because had I not, for example, the light source was moving and then the observer was, was at rest, okay? that would have been a similar situation because it is the relative velocity which is important here, unlike the case of Doppler effect in sound. Okay? So, it is not only in the Doppler effect in sound, it is not the relative velocity, you have to take into consideration the velocity of uh, the speed of uh, 
uh, the source and the speed of uh, the observer here. But here what we have it is the relative velocity of uh, between the observer and the source which is going to be important here. So it is if the source is moving or the observer is moving it does not matter as long because the velocity that we are considering here is actually the velocity v that you see in all the formulae will be will always be the, um, the relative velocity. Okay, so having done this let us uh, spend a couple of minutes on uh, on where uh, possible applications of, of this uh, derivation would be. Okay. Well, uh, as I told you, you see in uh, the, uh, the shift in frequency is related with the relative velocity with which uh, the object is moving. Okay. So, that immediately told people that maybe it could be used to, uh, to measure the uh, speeds of uh, distant stellar objects okay, like stars. So, what do, what do people do? What do astronomers do in that case? What they do is that uh, they take a photograph of uh, you know the spectra of elements uh, which is in the star. Okay, so, so, from the light which is emitted from the star, the light spectra is analyzed. So, uh, and uh, you know where the frequencies are people find out. Okay. And then they compare it with the known spectra of elements present in the star. Okay. So, this uh, known spectra of elements, so you can find the spectra of elements by uh, some experiment in the laboratory here on earth. And then they compare that spectra with uh, the spectra that was obtained from uh, the star. Now, if the star is moving away or you know there is a relative velocity, it is uh, there is a relative motion between earth and the star there and, and the star we are going to have a shift in spectral frequency. Okay? Now, from the shift in spectral frequency, you can then find uh, the speed of the star. Okay? So, it is got lots of applications in astronomy of course. Then many other, uh, you know, some other discoveries were also based on this. Okay? Another application, actually a very interesting application uh, of this would be to measure the, um, the temperature of hot plasma in nuclear fusion experiments or okay, the temperature of very hot uh, gases. Okay. Now, what they do is that well the principle is almost similar uh, you know to what I had uh, what I have outlined earlier. It is that they take uh, the uh, spectra of um, you know when things are moving at such high speed so they are emitting radiation. and. Uh, and this uh, this radiation is analyzed, and then if uh, if it's a known gas, so uh, the uh, from the known spectra you can find out what's the uh, shift in the spectral frequency, okay? And then you anal and then you can relate that with the speed of the molecule or the gas, uh, which is there inside uh, your experiment. And um, and then if you relate, if you if you remember your kinetic theory of gases. So, from this uh, velocity or you know the uh, mean velocity or the root mean square, velo uh, square velocity, you can always relate that to the temperature. Okay? So that, that can always be done from the kinetic theory. Okay? So, that will give you an estimate of the uh, temperature involved here. Okay, so, so, we have studied the uh, Doppler effect in, uh, in light as against uh, you know that now as against Doppler effect in sound. Okay? And then we have also talked a bit about a few applications. Fine. So, now we are going to shift gear a little bit and do something a little bit different and uh, go to another consequence of uh, special relativity and uh, study if uh, the um, mass of a body actually varies with the velocity with which it is moving. And I know that this is one of the things that many of uh, many of us are rather aware of uh, when, when we study physics or any of the elementary courses of science we take. Um, mass increasing with velocity and E equal to mc square, okay? but all of it in due time. Okay? Now, to do this, uh, uh, do this problem of whether mass of a body varies with velocity, let us start with, a, uh, with an example. Okay, and then uh, we'll we'll come to a conclusion. Okay, so concentrate on the uh, on the on 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 the uh, thing written down as s prime frame. Okay, 
So, what we have here is that we are considering uh, the inelastic head on collision of two identical particles A and B in, uh, in S prime frame let us say. So, what is this S prime frame? Well, it is a frame which is um, let us say it is moving with a certain velocity, certain uniform velocity V with respect to another frame S let us say. Okay. Now, in it we have the inelastic collision of uh, two bodies here named as A and B. So, they are of identical masses m prime both are of m prime and they are moving with the same speed you know opposite to each other and then they are heading towards a head on collision this mean speed is u prime here. So, we all put primes here because you know to keep in um, to keep uh, you know in to make uh, since we are talking of s prime frame. So, we, 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 are, we are dealing with prime coordinates here let us put it that way. Okay, and then all these velocities u prime uh, you know they are moving parallel to the x axis. Okay. Fine, so they are identical masses also. Now, how is the same event observed in S frame? Okay. Well, uh, you have different velocity, you have uh, you know in the S frame, uh, you are going to see the same thing as some uh, you know the velocities may not be uh, the same. The velocities, although they are moving, the well, the speeds are all the same. Uh, but um, if you if you take the modulus of, uh, of of the speeds in S prime frame, they are the same. The directions may be different, but the speeds are the same. But then uh, the velocities or the speeds are not going to be the same in S frame for a simple reason. It's that uh, you need to invoke Einstein's uh, velocity addition formula to find what's the velocity in uh, in S frame. Okay, and you're going to see immediately that it's not going to be the same. It's this written in, um, you know, in, in uh, for your convenience um, at towards the end of the slide. Uh, for example, if you just consider u1, so of uh, the mass of, of uh, the velocity of mass, okay, one uh, mass a rather. Okay, now you're going to see in terms of uh, the s primed quantities and then the velocity v. It's u prime plus v divided by one plus u prime v by c square. However, if it was minus u, since it was moving in the other direction, okay, u two that's the other, uh, you know, the other quantity, so that's minus u prime plus v into one minus u prime v by c square. So it's not going to be the same, okay. So you might be a little bit confused why you've written uh, different masses for identical masses, okay. So, in the S prime frame you had identical masses both are M prime, okay. but why is it that they are different in, in the S frame? Well, at this stage I do not know why they are different, rather I just take them to be different. So, just to keep myself in conjunction with the idea that I have different velocities, okay, I do not know what is going to be the masses. So, if it is if my, if my, rel if from my relativity from whatever I do it turns out from all this conservation laws I am going to invoke on, if it turns out that these masses are the same, they will turn out to be same, m1 will be equal to m2, but right now I am going to take m1 and m2 different, okay. Let us just see what happens, okay. So, that is what we have, we have the S prime frame and then in the S frame we are going to see uh, what it is going to be of the same event, the same collision, how is going to, how, how one is going to see in S frame. And remember S prime frame is moving with a certain uniform velocity v with respect to the S frame. Okay, so on top of that, of course, on the back of my mind, we we have uh, the conservation of linear momentum in our in the collisional process. Uh, well, this is rather something very sacrosanct. I mean, we are not going to violate all these conservation principles. Okay, whether it's non-relativity or uh, relativity or classical mechanics. I mean, the conservation laws are conservation laws. You're supposed to you're supposed to con you're supposed to maintain them. Okay. And, and then on top of that, we also have uh, the uh, total mass to be conserved, that is the total variable mass, you know, uh, the total mass. For example, if it is, uh, consider S prime frame, you have M prime A and then uh, uh, the other mass B also of M prime. So, after collision, 
the mass is going to be m prime plus m prime that's 2 m prime that's what I mean the total mass remains conserved in the collision process in each of these frames okay okay so so what does it mean here well from the linear momentum conservation what we have in this collisional process if you look at uh, the s prime frame it is very simple, it is going to be 0, is not it? I mean, it is they are moving, there. you have identical masses, the speeds are identical and opposite to each other, moving parallel to the x, -ax, x prime axis. So, u prime, uh, m prime u prime plus m prime minus of u prime. So, that is going to be 0. So, momentum, so if, if even if the, uh, if, so that tells you that uh, if you are going to have an inelastic collision in the end. So, uh, you know the mass is going to be whatever it is but the velocity or the it's it's it has to be at rest in in the s prime frame after the collision well something of that later on but what about this the total final mass of the combination is the final mass of the combination m prime plus m prime it's going to be 2 m prime there's nothing rocket science in that but the only thing is that it's going to be maintained after collision that's what i want to say okay so that's what we have the thing okay so, just one look, one more slide to, to recapitulate on this collisional process before the collision, okay. So, we have the S prime frame where we have identical masses A and B, okay. They have similar masses, they have the same mass M prime and they are moving opposite to each other parallel to the X prime axis. And then one is observing the same thing from the S frame. And then the S prime frame is moving with a certain velocity v with respect to the S frame. And from the S frame, we are going to see the same collisional process, but then the velocities are not going to be different. And then we have taken different masses here. We do not know what, we do not know whether the masses will be the same or different, but let us see if from all these uh, conservation laws, what turns out to be, uh, what, whether we have indeed different masses, whether m1 is separate is different from m prime okay okay so what happens after collision remember the collision is perfectly inelastic so what it means is the combined particle the combined particles will be at rest and they'll stick together in the s prime frame so that's what they are they will stick together in the s prime frame the total mass is 2 m prime and they are at rest now, what will be the velocity with which these thing will be seen to move from S frame? Okay, so is it V? We are going to find that out. Okay, but remember here, uh, what will be the total mass of this AB system here at in S frame? It is going to be M1 plus M2. Okay, because the total mass is conserved in this collisional process. Right. So, what about the velocity as we said? So, remember after collision, well still after collision, we are, we are still considering S prime frame to be uniformly moving with a certain speed v with respect to the S frame. Now, in S prime frame, A and B is at rest, right, is at rest. So, what does it tell you? And then the S prime frame is moving with velocity v with respect to S. So, what is the velocity with which a and B will be seen to be moving from S frame. Well, it is V. That is what we have. So, in S frame, we have these two particles. They are sticking together. Okay, since it is sticking together in S prime frame, it is sticking together. It is going to have mass M1 plus M2 and it is going to move with a certain velocity V, which is same as the relative velocity between S and the S prime frame. Okay. So, just to recapitulate the entire collision process, uh, what you see in the top of this slide is the situation before the collision, okay, both in S prime frame and the S frame. Just have a nice look um, on the situation what is happening in the S prime frame and the situation that we have in the S frame, okay. That is the, um, that's the situation before collision and then after collision, it is a perfectly inelastic collision. So, it is sticking together in S prime frame and total mass is 2m prime and it is at rest and then from S frame 
we're going to have the total mass to be m1 plus m2, the total mass is conserved here and then it's moving with velocity v. Okay, so next what we're going to do is that we're going to invoke the conservation of momentum in the S frame. Remember if we invoke the conservation of momentum in the S prime frame, it's going to be 0, isn't it? I mean the total momentum, total linear momentum in the S prime frame is 0, okay? And uh, what is it if you invoke that same conservation of momentum in the S frame, what is it going to be? Okay, it's going to be m1 u1 plus m2 u2, that's the total momentum in what? In the S frame before the collision and then after the collision, it's going to be m1 plus m2 whole times v, that's the velocity with which this combination a, a plus b or this m1 plus m2 is moving. Okay. Now, you rearrange a term and do a little simplification, so you immediately get what m1 plus m2 is. m1 plus m2 is nothing but v minus u2 divided by u1 minus v, well that's very simple and you just take all the m1s, you know all the terms involving m1s on one side, all the terms involving m2 on one side and then do simplification. Okay. And then what you do is that you substitute for u1 and u2 the expressions from Einstein's uh, velocity addition formula. So, you know that very well. So, u1 is u prime plus v divided by 1 plus u prime v by c square. And what is u2? u2 is minus u prime plus v divided by 1 minus u prime v by c square. So, you are going to substitute these two velocities so u1 and u2 okay, in the expression uh, given in the middle of your screen, the, given by this m1 by m2. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of uh, the algebra a bit, uh, rather a little bit of the algebra, but it's only, but if you miss this slide or the next, you're not going to miss the most of the physics, okay? I'm just doing it so that you will have the expression, you can, you can derive all these things by yourselves, okay? So what I have done is that uh, now what will be m1 plus m2 in terms of, of all uh, the uh, quantities in the prime frame, okay? So it's 1 plus u prime v by c square divided by 1 minus u prime v by c square. Again, we, what we do is that, okay, so we, we, we have derived up to uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, the expression at the top of this slide. Again, what we see is that a little more simplification, actually you can uh, derive this if you invoke again the, uh, the, uh, the Einstein's velocity addition formula. 1 minus u1 squared divided by c squared and what is 1 minus u2 squared divided by c squared. So you put in what is u1 and u2 in terms of u prime v's and all these things, you see rather very interesting expressions. You can, you can, you can actually check that out, okay? It's 1 minus u prime v by c squared whole square divided by 1 plus u prime v by c square whole square. Now from the top of uh, the uh, slide, you can see that this is nothing but m2 by m1 whole squared, okay? Now, now check what we have. Check the one on the left hand side, okay? So it's 1 minus u1 squared by c squared divided by 1 minus u2 squared by c squared and then on the extreme right hand side, you have this m2 by m1 in whole of squared. This is very interesting. These are the two expressions, the left hand side and the right hand side. Disregard the one in the middle, okay? What do you see? You see the masses, you see the velocities. Okay, what do you again see? What you see is m1 into 1 minus u1 squared by c squared, and you take a square root of that, is equal to m2 into 1 minus u2 squared by c squared. Take the square root of that, and that is invariant. And that's not changing. Okay, so what you see is that what do you have here? So m1 and m2 are the masses of identical particles. Okay, when the velocities are u1 and u2 respectively, I mean when I say m1 and m2 are masses of identical particles um, and you know does not carry much of a meaning, I mean then you could say that identical particles how come they have different masses, okay. But you see that they are moving at different speeds, okay. So this combination, some rather interesting combinations of m1 and u1 of these speeds with which they are moving 
and then you s that combination given by m1 uh, times 1 minus u1 squared by c squared that uh, that uh, square root of that that is a thing that is going to be invariant. Change the velocity, the expression for the mass changes, okay, that is becoming invariant, okay. So, what is invariant is this combination in whatever, um, you know, whatever mass and then its corresponding velocity that is possible here. So, what we have, so in a frame, if V is the velocity of the particle, if V is the velocity of the particle and, and M is its mass, then the quantity that you will have m into 1 minus v square by c square root over of that, that is going to be invariant, okay. Now, this is very interesting. Why? Now, what is this, well rather what, what should be the invariant quantity? Let us check that out. Now, if you take the velocity with which the mass is moving to be 0, so, so it is basically the mass is at rest. So, you consider, you consider a frame in which the particle is at rest and then you measure the mass there. Now, if the mass is m0 there, okay, so you plug in those quantities into the formula. So, m into 1 minus v square by c square. So, the mass is m0 and the velocity is 0. See the 1 in the bracket, 1 minus 0 square by c square and the root of that. So, that is going to be 1, no problem. And then on the right hand side, you have m0. So, that is going to be the invariant quantity and m0 is the mass of the same particle in a frame in which it is at rest. So, that is the uh, formula we are looking for. See that if you know that the invariant quantity is actually m0 here, you can now relate the mass of a body which is moving with a certain velocity v as m is equal to m0 which is the mass of the body in, in, the, in a frame in which it is at rest and then divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square. So, so what we have is the mathematical formula and then this is very interesting uh, of what the mass of the body will be if it is moving with a certain velocity v, okay. Now, let us see how uh, this is uh, related. So, let us have a graphical uh, illustration of this variation of mass and velocity. Um, it is if you if you look at uh, at the um, at the graph on your screens, what I have plotted here on the y axis is the mass and on the x axis I have v by c, okay. It is basically it is it is the velocity in the units of velocity of light. So, it is uh, someone you know it is starting from 0 to the speed of light. So, when v by c is 1, it is the, velo the speed of light. So, okay, and when, when v by c is 0, then you know that uh, the body is at rest, okay. Now, if we consider uh, a mass of, um, you know, of which is of, of at rest, which is m0 to be of, let us say, 10 kg, okay. Now, that is the green line. Okay, so that is the green line and uh, so whether if you increase the velocity or not, so that is m0, it is the, it's the uh, rest mass, so that is 10 kg. But as you increase the velocity, okay, see the red, see the red curve, see that at small speeds when uh, the velocity of, when the velocity of the body is not too high or it is too high, not too high compared to the speed of light you see that it's it's increasing it's increasing and then all and then when it when it reaches towards the speed of light you see all of a sudden it increases very fast i mean it, it's almost explodes okay so you do see that the mass of the body is increasing in a certain way when uh, when when the velocity is increased okay now i also wish to uh, remind you of one more thing it's that uh, when you are at very small speeds when on basically when you are non-relativistic speeds, okay, when V is much, much less than C, you can immediately figure out, look at the formula for example. Let us first look at the formula. So, M is equal to M0 divided by root over of 1 minus V square by C square. So, when is much, much, when V is much, much lesser than C, 
v by c almost tends to 0. So, the denominator in this uh, fraction is going to be 1, okay. So, m will roughly be equal to m0 when uh, the velocity is much much less than the velocity of light and that is exactly what you see in the graph, okay. So, when velocity uh, is much much less than the velocity of of, of light you are, you are you are in the non relativistic limit in the classical limit the classical world that we all live in okay you see that the red line actually converges with the green line so it actually fits with our experience okay okay so now let's see so uh, so let's let's see what uh, uh, have another example of what um, the consequences of this uh, of this formula would be let us just consider um, the uh, you know the rest mass of an electron okay the rest mass of an electron uh, if you look at the tables it is something like 9.11 into 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. Now suppose this is uh, moving with uh, it is a pretty high velocity it is 80 percent the speed of light okay. So will its mass be equal to you know how much will its mass what will its mass be will it be very near to 9.11 and 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms let us see. So that is the rest mass and the velocity v here is uh, 80 percent of the uh, speed of light. So what you see here will be m so that is the measured mass will be equal to m0 divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c squared okay. Now m0 you know what that is 9.11 in 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms okay and then 1 minus 0 0.8 square in c square divided by c square okay. Now this turns out to be something like 15 in 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. So you do see an increase in mass okay when you uh, when uh, when the velocity is increasing and that too when the velocity is much much uh, well, it is it's actually uh, 80 percent the speed of light, so it is quite a huge amount of uh, which is it's quite a, a large velocity. Okay, so by hope uh, today I have uh, you know you will be able to cover uh, some part of uh, the consequences of special relativity. We talked of Doppler effect in light and then the, um, the uh, interesting phenomenon of the mass of a body varying with its velocity. Um, in the uh, next section what we will talk of is the relation between mass and energy okay and I will heavily draw upon what we have uh, done so far about the consequences of relativity especially about uh, the uh, variation of mass uh, with its velocity. Well, thank you very much.